Wolfgang Merkel will focus on the resilience of democracies, following the question, what makes modern society resilient, how to strengthen the resilience of liberal democracies? Or is it actually just institutions? My first point is, why did uh, democratic resilience become such a prominent concept during the last uh, years? We talked already about uh, some of these causes. We lived through four decades of neoliberalism and increasing inequality and increasingly societies with uh, different singularities. We saw as a kind of reaction, but also a kind of reaction towards an insufficient capacity of democratic institution to represent the people. So we saw the rise of illiberal right-wing populist parties. But we saw uh, somehow later, uh, during the last decade, also an uh, increasing inclination of the left liberal camp to attack these right-wing populist movements and parties by asking for a closer observation of the secret, internal secret service uh, sometimes by restricting rights of these right-wing populist movements, sometimes thinking about banning uh, specific parties and movement. Instead of the classical instrument of liberalism arguing, convincing, and negotiating. So one of the diseases in most of the Western and Eastern democracy uh, is polarization. And we talked already about, and Larry Diamond did it, about the polarization of the United States of America. And with the uh, diversity or, the, or heterogeneity, we also saw an erosion of the sense of belongingness, the sense of social cohesion. So what is democratic resilience? I give you a brief definition. Uh, democratic resilience is the ability of a system to absorb, to adapt, or to recover from external disturbances and internal stressors without undergoing a regime change. Again, without undergoing a regime change while maintaining its defining democratic principles and goals. Next slide, please. So this is one of these schemes. They are hopelessly uh, over complex for a presentation and under complex for the problem I want to present. But if you look to uh, the four corners, I have paradigmatically uh, given some examples of the growing heterogeneity. There is certainly the right upper corner, socioeconomic inequality. There is a uh, diversity of world views. There is an identity diversity. We live through these debates, especially in the right-wing camp and in the left identitarian camp, and there is an ethno-cultural diversity. The classical liberal thoughts from John Stuart Mill to Robert Dahl always argued democracies which are heterogeneous are much more difficult to govern than more homogeneous uh, societies. But we all know uh, this has gone in the 21st century for the good or the bad. I leave it open, uh, becoming more and more heterogeneous or in, it's a bit a different term or diverse. So you see these four uh, attacks uh, or now the four causes for an uh, and elements for an increasing heterogeneity. And in the middle, 
you see what one can call the structure of a democratic system. The most fundam fundamental one is uh, constitutional powers and the balance of constitutional po powers. Then actors come into the play, the main actors, political parties, and of course civil society and the specific political uh, culture is uh, imminent to each democracy and then uh, what we sometimes call political community. I prefer this term for nation state uh, in normative and also in analytical terms. And then uh, to the right, uh, in the middle of the right uh, side, you see the function of resilience I have talked about. But on the left side, you see functions of the political system, which uh, may be important for the future of democracy, to which extent they will be fulfilled uh, by the governments. Understanding the future, what is ahead? Do we have instruments to solve the problems which are ahead? And also, uh, fair decision-making and fair results. This seems to me quite important for the future of liberal democracies. I don't go through uh, these four levels here. This is just a kind of approach where we can analyze more systematically on which of these four levels we have a potential uh, for democratic resilience and uh, on the other side on which of these levels we observe and degrees of democratic resilience. So one example, just to give you an example, if we talk about constitutional uh, powers, I do think we need a rebalancing of the executive and the legislative, which uh, moved quite a lot during the last decades to the executive, but we also need a rebalancing of input, throughput. Throughput is meant decision-making and output legitimacy. So there is a trend uh, that output legitimacy can be bought at the costs of participation and input legitimacy. If we go to the second level, parties and party system, uh, we should uh, distinguish between anti-system party, hardcore right-wing parties, and what Juan Linz has once called semi-loyal parties. If you look to the right-wing populist, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, they are not uh, complete anti-system parties. They are examples of the semi-loyal party. We should isolate anti-system party, but we should try to win over the adherence uh, to semi-loyal party. One example for the civic culture and civil society here, it will not be uh, so important to foster civil society in general. It will be more relevant to which extent civil society can produce bridging social capital across ethnicities, across religions, across classes, uh, and so forth. So it's very much about bridging and not bonding social capital. Last point, uh, last level, political community. Strengthening the common sense of belongingness is easily said and uh, not so easily done. And investing into people, investing with Ralph Dandorf into the life chances of the people, the equality of life chances of the people, and what is ahead, fair burden sharing, because we know crises produce high inequalities, and this is what we will see during the great transformation now in already in this decade in converting industrial uh, states and societies 
in uh, CO2 free societies. The last two points. The one is a common narrative. Do we need for our heterogeneous societies a common narrative? A thick narrative would be ethno-nationalism, national identity. This is something which is outdated, which is exclusive, and which is undemocratic. So we cannot use it. And then there is a thin narrative, what Sternberger and later on Jürgen Habermas have called constitutional patriotism. This is too abstract, too intellectual, in order to create the emotions Carolina has talked about uh, in the morning. So a socio-liberal narrative means we should have as a base certainly constitutional patriotism, we need social security in times of change, and we need more direct and deliberative participation we need fair institutions. Only fair institutions can produce fair outcomes. And uh, to some extent, democratic institutions are failing to produce uh, fair outcomes. Just distribution and equal life chances. My conclusion, there is a major attack uh, which comes from illiberal movements and parties from the outside, but there's also the danger that we, so to say, the left liberal camp, reacts illiberal to these kind of uh, external uh, attacks on the liberal democracy. Instead of what at least I am observing in our societies, of moralistic exclusion. We have to build bridges, bridges between nationalists and supranationalists, cosmopolitans and communitarians, universalists and left identitarians, and last but not least, winners and losers of the great transformation. Thank you.